Well, the Washington Federals are still looking for the answer after eight weeks of giving away the clues. And over in New Jersey, the generals add injury to insult. And a new man steps into the ring for the main event in the USFL. Today's show is brought to you by Strokes. From one beer lover to another, Strokes. The beat goes on in Tampa, where the Red Hot Bandits are joined by more than 43,000 raring-to-go rooters. Oakland's Fred Bassana is seeing Tampa's defense for the second time in two weeks, and after a 17-10 loss, he figures he's got a score to settle. Making like a one-armed bandit, the invaders Art Whittington is going for the jackpot. Gordon Banks is staying open more and more these days, and Basana's giving him the business. A third of his 27 completions are deposited with Banks, who gains 128 yards. But Basana's paying a big price for his passing interest as the Bandits ring up a league record 10 sacks. Steve Spurrier's Bandits have also been battered and bruised, but blessed with stand-in supreme. And this night, Mike Kelly becomes the third Tampa quarterback to pass for more than 300 yards. No matter who's throwing, Eric Trevelyan still knows his way to the end zone. It's the 11th touchdown of the season for E.T., who just loves making people happy. Trevelyan leads the league in touchdown catches, so in the second quarter, Kelly goes looking around for a less conspicuous target. It's Willie Gillespie's first touchdown since week one, and sneaks the bandits up by two touchdowns. The last call then goes to Greg Boone, who downs more than one invader on his way to a sobering score. The final tab comes to a 29-9 win for Bandit Ball, an act that seems headed for the playoffs. By then, Mike Kelly might be back on the bench, but for now, he's the man Steve Spurrier turns to. The Bandit's ball has belonged to Kelly for two straight weeks, and against Oakland, he completed 21 of 40 passes, finding eight different Tampa Bay receivers. All Kelly needed was a chance to show what made Georgia Tech fans proud. As a member of the Yellow Jackets, he set career records for passes and passing yardage, despite missing half his senior year with a shoulder injury. Kelly also set a tack record for total offense and showed a knack for coming through in the clutch. Now with Tampa's top two quarterbacks injured, Kelly has come through again, leading the Bandits to two straight wins and keeping them on top in the Central Division. Sunken at the bottom of the Eastern Division are the Washington Federals. But the Boston Breakers' Johnny Walton is still eyeing a playoff spot, and he shares that winning spirit with Frank Lockett. Mike Hohensey tries to answer back, but the Federals' prospects are dim when safety Joey Restick slips in. They've already been eliminated from playoff competition, but the Federals usually stay close, and Billy Taylor, who was cut by Boston, looks like a man with something to prove. Hohensey figures it's a tailor-made afternoon, and Billy bangs his way to 104 yards rushing. With the defense making its point, the feds are tied at seven, and the rookie from Minnesota is staying as close to Holmes as possible. Mike Holmes, that is, who's on his way to his fourth touchdown in two weeks and has the breakers playing catch-up. 
In his 10th pro season, Holmes is no stranger to the hero's welcome, but he also knows how quickly they forget, and the old pros on the other side are getting a point to remember. Come out, the guy we're missing, the guard is a the corner. Yeah, the front side linebacker, we're not returning, turning up too soon, Mike. The Breakers decide to keep it short and simple, and Walton nickels and dimes his way to his third 300-yard game. Hohensee is now just trying to hang on to a one-point lead, but there's no leaving well enough alone for the feds, and Mike Brewington sets up another Washington heartache. Smith tucks away a 2014 Boston win. But all Washington wins is the respect of breaker coach Dick Corey. This team is not a 1-10 and 10 or 11 team. They're a much better football team. They've lost about six games like they lost today. Which brings us to the question. Just who was it that Ray Yawks won in 11 Federals got their one win against? Well, it wasn't Boston who took advantage of two bad snaps to beat the feds by three in week three. And it wasn't the Arizona Wranglers who used a miraculous 98-yard touchdown toss to beat them by one. Even Joe Gillum couldn't bring Washington a win against the Generals, who helped themselves to a one-point win when the feds blew a last-second field goal. And Tampa beat them on a late touchdown by a kid who'd been in college just three days before. So then, ready to throw in the towel? Okay, here goes. Washington's only win came against the Michigan Panthers. Surely you remember Joey Walter's touchdown catch in week four, which gave the feds a 22-16 overtime victory. For the Federals, it was the best of times. They didn't care about the weather. They celebrated. They danced into the night. And they gave Coach Ray York a chance to tell the world what he thinks of winning. Beats the other alternative, I'll tell you that. The New Jersey Generals are only 3-8 and eight on the season, but four weeks ago, they took Greg Landry and his Chicago Blitz into overtime, and this week, Landry's again feeling the heat. In the early stages of round two, the Generals' defense has them thinking victory in the Meadowlands. For the first time in 12 games, Chicago's offense is shut out for a whole first half, but in the third quarter, Lenny Willis gets him in step. It's a simple score, which brings the Blitz to a tie, but can't quite bring the Generals to their knees. New Jersey's up and at him, now trailing by three in the fourth, but digging in with its best counterpuncher, Herschel Walker. Herschel's bully act finally gives some confidence to Generals fans, who've seen their team blow leads the last two weeks, but a blown extra point ends the celebration. And moments later, George Allen's alley cat defense stirs up some bad memories. Walker fumbles, allowing the Blitz to tie the game and send it into overtime. So just when a win seemed a shoe-in, Generals fans are suffering from deja vu. When last these teams met in Chicago, Herschel also fumbled away the Generals' best chance to win it. And as the teams dressed for overtime, more than just the coin was flipping. I don't see it! You're a Christian seat! He said tail! Tail! But this time, there's no controversy, and Chicago gets what it wants. Tim Cagle is in for injured Greg Landry, and though it's only the second catch of the day for Tremaine Johnson, the script looks all too familiar to New Jersey's Chuck Fairbanks. Then Allen adds a twist to the plot, sending out kicker Frank Corral on third down. Cagle's touchdown is his first since he was a junior in high school. And to be sure, Chicago's 1913 win is no fake. Even though Frank Corral didn't get the chance to kick the game winner, as we pointed out, he did have some impressive feats. And so our Toe of the Week award goes to the man from UCLA. In the fourth quarter, Corral's 35-yard field goal knotted the game and sent it into overtime. And what gave the Blitz the field position for that three-pointer? Well, of course, a booming Frank Corral punt. His five punts averaged 50 yards, and this one went 63 before easing out at the one. Corral also once kicked 87 straight extra points for the Rams, and now has 17 in a row. And by the way, look who led the way on that game-winning play. None other 
<laughs> and OK Corral. As uh, kickoff time nears, and as the sun goes down in the west behind us here at Sun Devil Stadium. With the temperature at 101 degrees, the Arizona Wranglers warm up Ready? for their stiffest challenge to date. Begin. One, two, three, four, five. Again. One, two, three, four, five. Against the Philadelphia Stars of President Carl Peterson, the Wranglers will need plenty of good wishes. Hey, you have a good day today. All right, too. Stay healthy. The fifth and fiddle stars are 10 and 1, and quarterback Chuck Bucina has them riding the crest of a seven game winning streak. Each week, Kelvin Bryant seems to invent a new twist or turn, but his favorite is still the one that counts for six. Facing the star's unrelenting defense, Alan Risher may be just slightly intimidated. Risher soon learns how the stars have held opponents to less than 10 points per game, and the coach's expressions reflect the one-sided affair. And when it's all over, hard feelings aren't forgotten. But the results show two teams going in opposite directions. For a time, Denver's Red Miller had his team headed for the top. But then things began to go astray, and the goal went into a four-game tailspin. As usual, it was the head coach who felt it most, and Red Miller's job was lost in the shakeup. I think that uh, the players do not respond to negatives. And uh, I think we need to get in a positive way, and I, uh, I, that's what we intend to do. A former Super Bowl coach in Denver, Red Miller was very popular in the Mile High City. Gold fans and players expressed their feelings in the wake of Miller's firing. We're a team, and we're going to be a team, and whatever happens is happening. Uh, you know, Coach Red, you know, I said I came to play for Coach Red. My feeling right now is I hate to see it happen to a man of the, the caliber of Red, and, and you know, he's... He is the reason I was here, him and Whitey, and both of them are gone now. And it's, uh, you know, a lot of things are up in the air. So the inevitable finally happened. In its 12th week, the USFL got its first firing and its first emotional goodbye scene between players and coach. While Red Miller will move on, the goal is left to sort it all out and try to reverse the team's recent fortunes. Though some gold fans did stay home in protest, 33,000 turn out to see whether interim coach Charlie Army can get the team back in step and guide Denver to the pot of gold against division rival Los Angeles. Mike Ray is guiding the Express in place of injured Tom Ramsey, and his journey into Denver territory turns into a tour de force for David DeMars. Alvin White is one of two previously unseen Denver quarterbacks to jump into the fray in place of injured Ken Johnson. And White finds a way to ease some of the blues over red. Harry Sidney chews up the green and puts the gold seven points in the black. Ray's air attack is persistent, but so is Denver's defense. L.A. coach Hugh Campbell tells his quarterback not to give up, and Ray finally cashes in with John Barnett, whose third quarter touchdown ties it up. Denver Rooters are seeing lots of new faces, and this quarterback is Fred Mortensen, who guides the gold into go-ahead range late in the third quarter. Brian Spielman sets up for a 50-yard field goal try, and he's as good as gold and raises Denver's hopes. But a fourth down play for L.A. could be the biggest of the day. Ray reads a blitz and quickly rewrites the ending with co-author Wilbert Haslett. Army's defense faces a stiff challenge, and Campbell decides to give his Air Force a rest. On third and goal, John Barnett crosses the border and gives the Express a tooth and nail victory. I think we've got a good understanding. Next to sink uh, his teeth into Denver's problems is former Bronco Craig Morton, who just this week was named the Gold's new head coach. Uh, I think that one of the, the things we got to do is make it a cure-all to get this thing on a positive note.
Well, Birmingham coach Raleigh Dodge and Michigan coach Jim Stanley are staying calm. But they're in the eye of a hurricane of excitement being generated by an impending Central Division showdown between the Predatory Panthers, who've won six straight, and the Stampede and Stallions, who've won four straight. But while the Panthers are hot, they're tied for the league lead and fumbling the ball away. And the first big break goes to Bobby Lane and the Stallions, who fumbled fewer times than anyone in the league. Ken Talton is on his way to his second straight 100-yard day. But Raleigh's messenger service has a surprise for the 12th play of the drive. It's the third pass of the year to Steve Stevens. Bobby Abear hasn't been picked off in four weeks till Larry McPherson turns the trick and puts Birmingham in position for a 10-point lead. Jim Stanley is still keeping his cool over Abear's early problems, and the Michigan coach figures the best way to keep the winning streak alive is to have two of his prize rookies go for broke. With two assists from Birmingham, Anthony Carter gets the goal. And before you can say touchdown, the Panthers jump back into the game. And AC is number one in the hearts of Michigan fans. But not for long. His fumble punt turns into a big gainer for the Stallions, who had been stopped without a first down. Carter would like to hide, but shakes it off and watches as Lane delivers the next cruel blow. Greg Anderson makes it a 10-point lead at half. Hebert gets ready to take his lumps in the second half, but with fullback Ken Lacey racing to his second 100-yard game, the conservative approach appears to be in order for Michigan. But even if he's not calling for a pass play, Hebert isn't afraid to put his own neck on the line. Hebert falls slightly short, but John Williams' second one-yard touchdown of the fourth quarter pulls delirious Michigan into a 20-20 tie. It's up to Novo Bajovic to give the Panthers the lead, but the biggest block of the game sends it into overtime. The coin toss comes up Michigan, but the Panthers can't cash in, and Birmingham's Scott Norwood becomes the man of the hour. Norwood's 46-yard thump ends Michigan's winning streak and puts the Fighting Stallions right in the middle of the crowded Central Division race. Norwood's field goal won the game, but this play is the one that will be remembered. ABC's Fred Manfred describes it. Intercepted by Michigan! Intercepted by Fred Logan! Logan ran around in the end zone, threw it down in jubilation, picked up by Birmingham for a touchdown! So is it an interception or a touchdown? In his last radio work before becoming head coach of Denver, Craig Morton shed some light. How can anybody believe that play? He thought his momentum carrying back in the end zone, and he stood up, and he thought, well, I caught this ball in the end zone, was doing a dance, and you wonder why Tom Landry told his team that he can't spike the ball anymore? Oh, they ruled no touchdown! Oh, my! He ruled uh, Fred Logan was down on the one-yard line when he came up, that somebody evidently had touched him. He was down, the ball's dead, the play stops. From one form of chaos to another, with the season two-thirds over, this is how the battle for two of the playoff spots is shaping up. One of these teams will win the Central Division. Another will almost certainly be the wild card. Tampa has hung in despite losing John Reeves, who will be back in about a month, and Jimmy Jordan, who might be ready to go this week. Late edition Gary Anderson has been a real plus for the Bandits. Chicago's teamwork has been a big factor in the Blitz' success, but now everybody's preseason favorite has lost quarterback Greg Landry for the season with a broken ankle and will really have to pull together. The Boston Breakers have Marcus Merrick and the big play defense, but playing in the same division as Philadelphia, the best they can realistically hope for is a wild card. Michigan won six straight after losing four straight. Now the Panthers have lost again, and the question is whether they'll be up or down the rest of the way. With Bobby Lane at quarterback, Birmingham is 6-1, and one, and Jim Smith is a welcome partner. But the Stallions face a murderous schedule from here on in, so they may need a little bit of luck to hang in the playoff scramble. On defense, of course, luck can play a part. But with certain guys, when they got you... They really got you. You really got me going. You got me so I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. You really.
really got me numb. You got me so I can't sleep at night. Yeah, you really got me numb. You got me so I don't know what I'm doing. I'm doing that. 